By request, we are doing a message that I did a couple years ago. And uh, initially when somebody asked me to redo this message, I was thinking that it was just one message. And as I look back a couple years, these happened about three years ago, a little over three years ago. As I look back at them, I realized it's not just one message, it's actually a series of three or four messages. And the thing that made an impact on certain people in our youth group at the time, they're remembering a stretch, a stretch of messages that we did. And so um, in, in order to honor the request to do that message or that, to do that topic or whatever, we're gonna do for the next couple weeks, all of these messages from 2015 that pertain to this particular, uh, this particular thing. And this, this message series, it's, it's a message series out of Genesis. We're studying the book of Genesis, and, and in the book of Genesis, it's basically Bible stories and gives us all the opportunities uh, that we can imagine to tackle all kinds of different topics, like the topics you guys deal with on an everyday basis, right? Uh, sometimes, sometimes not, but, but usually we'll, we'll do a series like that and we'll hit the things that are really in your life. And this one is one of those that did that in a particularly explicit sort of way. And so uh, it's kind of a sub-series of three or four that ended up being called The Pact. That's not what I called them when we did it, but that's what they ended up becoming remembered as, The Pact. And so we're going to do The Pact messages again, and uh, various reasons for that. But this was requested, and, uh, and I'm glad that it was. And so um, with no further ado, please turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 29. I'll have it on the screen in case... You don't have a Bible, don't want to look in your Bible, whatever, I'll have it on the screen. But Genesis chapter 29, tonight we're looking at verses 16 through 27. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful in form and appearance. And Jacob loved Rachel. And he said to Laban, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, this is of course seven years later, Give me my wife, that I may go into her, for my time is complete. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. We call that a wedding. But in the evening he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Laban gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her servant. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. It wasn't Rachel. It was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this you've done to me? Did I, did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? And Laban said, It is not so done in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete this week, complete the week of this one, and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Let's pray and then we'll move on. Heavenly Father, you are faithful to us, and, uh, and the good plans you have for us do not depend on us. They don't depend on what we can do for you, and uh, they don't depend on, on how well we do with our life or how clean we keep it. They depend on you and your goodness, God, and your faithfulness to us to keep your word to us. Help us to trust in you that, uh, that if we do the things that you say, like we learned about in VBS, that if we hear these words of yours and we do them, we're building a house on a rock that will not be shaken when the flood comes. When the end of our life comes, or the end of this world comes, like we sang in that song, when my time is fading, the end draws near. Uh, Lord, at that time, may you find us faithful to you, not because of the things that we do for you, God, but because of the things you do in us. We depend on that, Lord, and help all those things to be manifest in our life for the sake of your glory, for the fame of your great name. In Jesus' name, amen. So what did we talk about last week? Last week in our study in Genesis, Jacob meets Rachel and offers to serve her father for seven years so that she could be his wife. Our contemporary idea of romantic love in many movies and stories, namely the one that I talked about last week, Fifty Shades of Grey, 
Our contemporary idea is depicting more and more that women are loved by a heroic man who takes something from them and trade for the love that they want from him. I call this depiction of love pornography. The fact that it's presented to us as a love story in many books and movies, it's really pornography. It's a premarital, extramarital outlet using a twisted, disgusting, and disfigured misrepresentation of something that's truly beautiful. Something beautiful like real, true love. The greatest demonstration of true love is what God did for us in Jesus Christ, who did not take. He did not take from us. The Son of Man did not come to be served, Jesus said, but to serve and to give his life, to give his own life as our ransom. So that was one of the themes I identified here in this Genesis story. Jacob didn't take from Rachel. He loved her. He didn't take from Rachel. Jacob in this story is like Jesus in a, and very different from the world and the world's depiction of romance. He gave. He gave up everything for her and he served for seven years, whereas our contemporary pornographically informed idea of love is one in which a girl might find herself loved as long as she allows a man to take away her privacy, take away her dignity, and take away her safety. And that's what pornography does to its subjects. That's what our culture, our social media, television, and movies have taught girls to expect and it's taught boys to do. In, in the few weeks surrounding Valentine's Day in 2015, 50 million people flocked to see Fifty Shades of Grey and be dazzled and titillated by the so-called true love story depicted in Fifty Shades of Grey. So I want to contrast our tendency to flock to disgusting and disfigured misrepresentations of love and beauty by challenging you boys to do whatever you've got to do to lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and run with endurance the race that's set before us looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He endured a horrific execution to you boys. We men are drawn to beauty, aren't we? We look for the kind of girl we want to date, don't we? We can't imagine pledging our entire lives to a woman in marriage unless she's the most beautiful woman available to us that we have half a chance with at the time. Somehow, beauty is connected to quality. Somehow, a woman's beauty is connected to our odds of appealing to them as men. Hmm? Why do we think that we're wanting to be with the woman we want to be with? And beauty has a lot to do with that, and as we think about that as teenagers, right? The more beautiful she is, the better looking and more successful man she gets. This is how things tend to play out for people in our culture. It's all distorted, though. It's too bad. Because the upshot, the trade-off is that we, as men, treat women less and less like people. We treat them less and less like personalities and more like objects and items. But it's still based on a man's desire to possess something, to have something for ourselves of real beauty, right? And it's God that gave us that desire. Make no mistake. It's God that gave us that desire. But instead of beauty being a prize that's worth waiting for and working for and making ourselves able and fit to partner with it, making ourselves able and fit to care for it and possess it, we've turned to something that's easy to get, easy to possess, and we've disconnected beauty from any true quality. True beauty is not in the temporary, fleeting, and evil pleasures promised by pornography. It's not in the evil pleasures of fooling around with girls who won't be your wife. That's not what true beauty is. If you want to look at something beautiful, then fix your eyes on something that's truly beautiful and of lasting worth, namely a bride prepared for you by God, and then fix your eyes on that, even though you might not know who she is, you don't know her name yet, maybe some of you do, but you probably don't, fix your eyes on her, and then lay aside every sin, every sin, and run the race, because it's not going to happen for you all that soon, most likely. And guys, like I said, you might not know who that is, but God has in store for you a beautiful bride. Behold the beauty of God's purpose for you and serve that purpose with all your heart and aim to possess that beauty for yourself. And if, if you do, if you can, you'll become the kind of man that's able to rightly possess beauty. Because 
All you've done in order to have her is serve her. All you've done in order to have her is give your life for her. Not your physical pleasure for your pride, but for your happiness, for your joy. You guys know that if you tell a woman that you want her because of her physical beauty, so that you can get physical pleasure or pride from having someone with you that looks so nice, she might feel honored. She might feel honored that you feel that way about her, that you feel more about her that way than anybody else for now. But she has to dishonor herself first in order to feel that from you. Because the one you're really trying to honor when you do that is you. Is you, not her. Besides that, her security and your love is already flushed down the tubes. Because if you make her appearance the basis for her appeal to you, then you've only promised her love for as long as she pleases you with her appearance. But if she understands by both your words and actions that you really enjoy her, and nothing would make you happier than her, regardless of what she has to physically offer you, then you honor her by making her the object of your commitment and your joy. And then she actually is honored, because it's not yourself that you exalt when you do that. You're not making her a tool to please herself with, or a trophy to hoist, or pimp for your pride. It's her you exalt. She doesn't, have to dis she doesn't have to dishonor herself in order to fit your macho, misogynistic, and, and disregarding brand of flattery because all your actions, commitments, and affections are moved in an effort to magnify and defend her honor, which is what you take pride in most for her sake. The Genesis story was about Jacob serving seven years for Rachel. So I challenge you boys, I challenge you boys last week to commit to seven years of purity with your body and your eyes. Job 31 verse 1 says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I look upon a virgin? So after seven years, most of you guys are going to be the same age that Jody and I were when we, were when we got married. We were married when we were 21 doesn't have to be seven years for you guys. Most likely it'll be more for some of you. Maybe far more, but the point is the same. Until God brings the bride, capital B, until God brings the bride, something God gives as a gift of real and true beauty, you young men should serve her. You should serve her and her father and her heavenly father with your purity, expecting nothing in return except the joy and happiness you'll finally receive from her from being wed to her, for whom you dedicated your chastity for, regardless if you know her, or even if you don't know who she is today. Even if you don't know. It takes a singular focus, guys, just like Jacob when he served for seven years. To Jacob it seemed like only a few days, the text says, because of how much he loved Rachel. What a beautiful story, guys. Copy that story. You want to create a beautiful story for your bride someday? Copy that story. Like I said last week, I want you all to love true love stories. And I want you to live true love stories. I want the stories I tell about you for the next decades, because I'm going to talk about you guys in the youth group that I led back in the... 2010s and stuff, right? I want the stories I tell about you guys for the next decades to be true love stories that model what Jesus did for us. But it takes a singular focus. It takes purity of heart and mind that comes from God. So again, guys, lay aside pornography if you're looking at it. Don't fool around with girls, guys. Your wife deserves every glance and every touch from you. And here... I challenged you girls last week to wait for love. Wait for love. Don't get swept away by disgusting and disfigured misrepresentations of love. Wait for the man who's given up everything else and everyone else to show you that because he longs to be with you, even if he doesn't know who you are right now, he longs to be with you and for his own happiness, he's spending his time now serving you with purity and with chaste devotion, not fooling around with girls in the meantime. Wait for him. Wait for him. Wait seven years or whatever it takes for a man who's serving seven years for you. He'll be worth waiting for, big time. I want you to understand, girls, that kind of love, true love, that's not about taking. It's only demonstrated by a man through his serving and his giving. And like I said last week, it is never demonstrated sexually, not through flattery, not through manipulation or force. Never. 
Now, as to why I had decided to take a few weeks to talk about this, to show how the love of Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom, and how Jacob was a type or a shadow of our Savior in this story, in contrast to pornography, here's the reason why I had decided to do this originally. Here's why. We, too, can be a type in our own story through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can be a Christ type, just like Jacob, and we can overcome lust. We can overcome the world's disfigured misrepresentation of romance, and we can be pure in heart, laying aside every weight and sin, and run that race. Guys and girls, you are being assaulted by the culture around you. Now, I'd be naive to presume, guys, that pornography is new to most of you. I don't think I'm introducing that word to you guys, or introducing the concept of that to you guys. I don't think so. I'm taking orders from the Word of God and responding to Satan's pornographic assault, I'm responding to the world's pornographic assault with scriptures like this, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 7. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience. Incredible, being ready to punish every disobedience. And when your obedience is complete, look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. So guys, how many of us who were here last week made that pact? How many of us made that promise? Even if you didn't, Guys, even if you did, perhaps you recognize that it would be good to make that pact. The kind of pact that I'm talking about. Maybe you realize it'd be good. I suspect whether you made that pact or not, you've discovered that to keep a pact like that isn't going to be easy. It's not going to be easy at all. If it's worthwhile to make, God, make good promises that make us more faithful followers to God, we've either broken those promises or we've planned to break those promises. Or we'll inevitably will break those promises, right? Either that or we didn't make good promises because we wanted to keep doing the things that keeping good promises mean we can't do, right? That's our big problem as people, you know. The Bible says in John 3, 19, Jesus said that here's, here's the judgment, that they loved the darkness. They didn't like the light. They hated the light. And people remained in the darkness so that their evil deeds, which they loved, wouldn't be, wouldn't be exposed. So, as, so, did you make the pact or not? You know, it's going to be hard to make the pact. As though not making the promise, so we don't break the promise when we flirt, we won't break the promise when, when we make out, or we won't break the promise when we look at porn. We think that's good. That's how we tend to think. I'm not going to make that promise because it'd be better if I don't make the promise if I do that stuff. If you made that pact last week with me, that's awesome. If you didn't, why? Why didn't you? Guys, I, mean, I asked you to make an impossible pact. Impossible. Seven years. What about the last seven days? Seven years is impossible. It's impossible. So did I set you up for failure from the start? Kind of. Mostly, it's important to our learning to identify exactly what good we're actually capable of. What good are you actually capable of? Based on the way the next seven years is going to go for each of us, when so much good, when so much beauty is at stake, we'll no doubt see how incapable of good we really are. Think you guys and girls can wait seven years? Seven years to get this right? For true beauty to be yours in your life? Seven years? How prone to the disgusting we really are. But the solution to our failure is not us. In our story in Genesis, there's another character that we kind of skimmed over last week, and his name is Laban. He's Rebecca's brother. Rebecca is Isaac's wife, Jacob's mother. So Laban is Jacob's uncle, and yes, this would make Rachel, who Jacob loved, this would make them cousins. And so that's something that's been happening all over the world and in many cultures. It still happens today in many cultures around the world. Uh, but in, in America and Western Europe, that's something that's been becoming very, very weird. But in old times, in Bible times like this, it was totally normal. Uh, in fact, it was regular for a, for a father, two fathers who are, who are brothers, to, or a brother and a sister. It was common for them to say, let's, let's make a pact. 
for our children's sake, and we can we can further our family name and share lands and things like that. It was a normal thing. Anyway, so Jacob made a promise to work for his uncle for seven years so that he could marry Rachel. And Laban, his uncle, promised that Jacob could marry Rachel after seven years. That's what Jacob said he wanted to do, and Laban agreed, right? But at the last second, Laban did not keep his promise. He didn't let Jacob marry Rachel, but Jacob thought he was marrying Rachel. Let's back up. Today we must be doing things a little bit differently than they did then, right? For one thing, we have electricity, and when it's dark, we can see just fine compared to oil lamps, right? From back then. Besides, in, in weddings these days, the bride and groom exchange vows face to face, right? And then they light a unity candle, listen to some songs, and then they kiss each other, right? Then afterwards, there's a dinner, there's a party and a dance, and the newly married couple go off somewhere to spend their first night together, and hopefully it's their first night together. Now, I have no idea what weddings were like in the Middle East thousands and thousands of years ago, but they could have been like weddings today, because Jacob would have had plenty of opportunities in weddings like today to see his bride and say something like, gee, you sure look a lot more like your sister than you usually do. It wouldn't happen. Jody has two sisters. Sometimes they do things and they say stuff that causes them to resemble one another quite a bit. But not in such a way, they're a lot alike, but not in such a way as to where I would have mistaken either of Jody's sisters for her on my wedding to Jody. I wouldn't have. So the way we do weddings and the way Jacob's wedding went had to be very, very different in whatever way. <laughs> Here's the point. Jacob thought the entire time that he was being married to Rachel. And he didn't find out until the next morning when it was too late, it was too late, that he had actually married her older sister, Leah. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? What is going on here? How, after seven years of Jacob serving Rachel, knowing that he's going to want to get married to Rachel, did it just slip Laban's mind? Did it just slip his mind to fill Jacob in on the rules that they live by in their country? Oops. Oh, shoot, I didn't, I forgot. Jacob made a promise to serve for Rachel. Laban made a promise to give Rachel as a bride to Jacob. But then at the last second, Laban switched him. Laban switched him. Oh, shoot, the younger one can't get married first. What do I do? Oh, man, what am I going to do? Well, I, don't, I don't think that's what's going on here. I don't think that's what's going on here. Seven years earlier, Laban hears Jacob offer to serve seven years for Rachel. It's very clear what Jacob wants, isn't it? Giving the most benefit of the doubt to Laban as possible, let's assume that Laban never brings up the rule about his older daughter Miriam first because he truly believes that most likely some other man is going to come around and want to marry Leah well within that seven years. We're talking about seven years here. Leah's probably going to get married. Leah is an exceptional woman. We find that out later. She loves the Lord and she has an inner beauty that would make her a wonderful, wonderful wife. But here, not only did Jacob want to marry Rachel and not Leah, but evidently nobody else wanted to marry Leah either for seven years. Right? The only clue the Bible gives us as to why that is is that she had weak eyes. Some people say that means she had pretty eyes but wasn't pretty otherwise. There's also a possibility that she probably couldn't see well, had eye-related health issues or something like that that would have been, that would have just made harder for things back then, harder to deal with no, back in their time. Cow. What's that? Her name means cow. Cow? cow? Leah means cow? That's cruel. Okay, so maybe she wasn't a very attractive person, but but whatever, the only the only thing that we have related, or as a clue probably is her name then, and, and the, the fact the Bible says that she had weak eyes, right? Regardless, Time's going by. Time's going by, and the day when Jacob will get will want to get married to Rachel is getting closer and closer. Do I tell Jacob that our rules are that Leah has to get married first? Do I tell him? How long will Jacob stick around and wait for Rachel if it takes years and years for Leah to get married first? What if Leah never does get married? Hmm. Will Jacob ask for money for these last seven years instead? I can't afford that. Jacob's worth millions. Do I risk forcing Jacob to break our rules and elope with Rachel and run away with her? What if they run away? No, no, wait, 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 wait. I got it. I got it. I won't tell him. I'm not going to tell him. I'm going to trick Jacob into marrying Leah instead of Rachel. Then he can't run off. And I don't have to pay him. I'll keep my promise, kind of. 
I mean, it's not my fault that our country has these rules, after all. And, and oh, I know, I know. If Jacob truly loves Rachel, he'll work for free for another seven years so that he can marry her too. In the meantime, Jacob's going to make me rich. Jacob's going to make me very, very rich. Yes. I like it. I like it. And Laban, Laban sent this beautiful love story into a downward spiral. He prostituted his daughter Leah and enslaved her to a man that would end up never loving her the way that Laban should have wanted her to be loved. Laban, as her father, should have wanted Leah to be loved the way that Rachel was loved. For Laban, this was to save face, to save pride at best. He didn't want to be the guy in town with an ugly old maid for a daughter, a daughter that no man wanted to marry. He didn't want to be known for marrying Rachel off anyway and breaking their country's rules. Beside that, most likely, it was to generate another seven years of labor by swindling Jacob in order to get it. It was greed. Laban motivated by greed, and it was deceit. And he broke his promise to Jacob, and he trafficked his daughter and her maidservant in order to get seven more years out of Jacob. This is theft. This is theft big time, not only from Jacob, but from Leah, his own daughter. So next week, guys, we're going to keep going in this pack series. And we're going to talk about the devastating impact that this act, that the act of trafficking Leah and her servant, we're going to talk about the devastating impact that this had on this family and what heartbreaks and hardships came about because of it. We'll talk about our own lives the sorts of evils that we tend to tolerate within ourselves and who we're willing to disregard, who we're willing to part with, who we're willing to manipulate or victimize, how we compromise our honor and our principles in order to gain wealth, in order to gain power or position over others, or to have sinful pleasures from others, all at someone else's expense. Laban's greed and his pride brought this beautiful story crashing down. The beauty is still there. Because it ends up being a beautiful true love story after all. Not for everyone all the time, but it ends up being the most beautiful true love story ever. Not because of any of the people in this story though. All the humans in this story at some point or another end up being disgusting. They all do. They all play a part that disfigure and misrepresent what's beautiful about marriage, just like we all do. In our own story, we have the opportunity to serve our bride. We have the opportunity to purify and be single-minded and lovingly focused, guys, don't we? We have that opportunity, men, to love our bride, to serve her with a single, pure mind and loving focusedness. And girls, you have the opportunity to wait patiently, wait faithfully, keeping your purity and chastity unstained for the pure, truly heroic man who loves you and is keeping himself for you regardless of whether he knows you or not. But like I said, that's how you know he'll be, he'll be worth it. And guys and girls both, even if you've made mistakes, even if you've made mistakes, even if you feel like you've ruined yourself and are totally unworthy of this glorious purpose for love and its greatest romantic expression, you have the opportunity to promise yourself now to God and his good purposes for you. It's not too late to make this pact. On the other hand, on our own, our hearts are greedy and divisive. Our hearts desire dominance over others. Pleasure, power, and control. These are the things our hearts demand from us. Pleasure, power, and control. These are the things that the world around us approves of us going after. We want beauty, and we want to possess it, but we don't want to be honor-bound to protect it. Hmm? We want beauty, we want to possess it, but we don't want to be honor-bound to protect it. We just want to use it. We just want to get pleasure from it, then discard it once we discover something even prettier that will make us feel more pleasure or more power for possessing her and using her as well. That's what we do, man. There is opportunity for our lives to tell true love stories of real beauty. But without the Lord, without God, we are too much like Laban. Without God and without a passion for his glory, Without a passion for his honor and purity, we'll break down and we'll break promises all our lives. You know you will. You know you will. You know how you will. You do. 
I do too. And if you found yourself to be more like Laban than Jacob in your own story, I don't want you to lose heart. The beauty of this story in a saga of broken promises, deceit, bitterness, and greed is kept and secured by the plan and purpose of God, the author of the story, who is beautiful beyond description and pouring 100% of what is beautiful about himself into this true love story. The story has its ups and downs along the way, it sure does. It actually gets a lot worse. A lot worse. But even in the book of Genesis, especially at the end of the book of Genesis, we get snapshots of what beauty God has in store for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. If this story has ups and downs and it gets way worse somewhere along the way, then how could we know? How could Jacob know that this story of beauty and love for all will end well? How can we know? Here's how. Because unlike Laban and unlike you and me, God declares the glorious and beautiful end from the beginning. And God never breaks his promises. Let's pray. God, we depend on you for good. We depend on you for beauty. We depend on you for whatever good you have in store for this world. We will chase down and possess the counterfeit. We will trade what's truly beautiful and what's truly eternal, what's truly infinitely valuable, and we will trade it for something temporary. We'll trade it for something disgusting. We'll trade it for something that we can't keep. Lord, your servant, Matthew Henry, quoted, saying, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he can't lose. God, make that reality precious to us as you promised it in Christ. Make it ours through the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to see true beauty, to want true beauty, to live our lives serving true beauty for your name's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.